Hi everyone and welcome to our summary on artificial clones in animals. What we're going to be doing in this video then is having a look at the specification reference 6.2.1d, both parts of it, because we're looking at how we're going to produce artificial clones in animals, the advantages, the disadvantages as usual. So when we're considering the artificial clones in animals then, we need to first of all understand what we're using. Now, when we're talking cloning in animals, we are going to be using totipotent cells. Now, hopefully we remember the meaning of the word totipotent. If you think of toti like total, this is the one that can actually differentiate into all types of cell. So what we actually find is this is a phrasing that we need to get a little bit picky with in how we're going to write this. Don't just say totipotent cells can differentiate into all cells not good enough you need to be saying it didn't differentiate into all types of cell so please just be a little bit mindful of how you actually phrase your answers there where do we find these totipotent cells well they're found in very early embryos in animals what we're going to start off with then is this idea of reproductive cloning now, reproductive cloning is how we're going to produce large numbers of genetically identical animals. So this is what we would use for cloning these elite farm animals, for example. So these are the ones that have gone through the process of selective breeding over many generations to give us these farm animals that have the best characteristics in some way or another. So they are elite. They are the best of the best. Or we can actually use this to clone our genetically modified animals. So this is going into the idea that we've created some kind of genetically modified creature with a strange trait. So it could be that within their milk, they produce something that is unusual. Now, there is another use of this reproductive cloning, which is our potential to actually preserve endangered animals. So if we've got some kind of an animal that is obviously quite endangered, we don't want to purely rely on natural reproductive processes because that means they might still end up going extinct. If we could use this reproductive cloning, we could potentially produce larger numbers of them and therefore protect the species from extinction. What we're going to do then is have a look at the processes that we can use to clone our animals artificially. So the first one is a process called embryo splitting. So what we're going to do is go through this process so we understand how this comes about. First thing then is we're going to start with a zygote. Now the zygote is basically our fertilized egg cell. Now, we will have created this zygote through the process of IVF, in vitro fertilization. So this is obviously a lab-based process whereby we've got the egg and then we introduce the sperm into basically a Petri dish together. Once they've been introduced, they fertilized, formed the zygote, we actually allow them to go through cell division to create this small ball of about 16 cells called a morula. So we can see that down in the bottom corner there. This is what we're making. What we then do is we separate those cells and they're going to then continue dividing. So what we've actually done is once we've got that little ball of cells, we're literally splitting them up, hence embryo splitting. We've literally got a ball of cells. We're then separating the cells out. They continue dividing and then each of these small masses of cells is going to be implanted into a surrogate. They will then hopefully grow, develop as a usual baby would be born, but they will obviously be genetically identical to one another. Now, in terms of one thing to bear in mind as far as embryo splitting goes, it's still relying on obviously this process of fertilization, so an egg and a sperm joining together. So in terms of the exact genotype and the exact phenotype, that's going to be dependent on what sperm and what egg were used. So we're not actually going to see those characteristics until those organisms are born. 
So what we do know is if we're using obviously certain animals, eggs and certain animals, sperm, you know roughly what's going to come out and you know that all of the offspring will be genetically identical to one another, but you won't know the exact genotype or phenotype until they are physically born. The second process we're going to have a little look at then is one called SCNT or somatic cell nuclear transfer. The basic overview of this then is that we're going to take a nucleus from an adult cell and then insert it into another cell. So the whole idea being that we're basically creating a clone of whatever animal we took the original nucleus from. And this was how we created the most famous of all of our little clones, Dolly the sheep. And this was all the way back in 1996, which is now way before any of you were born, which makes me feel old, but we're just going to move on from that quickly. What we're going to do then is work through the steps in our SCNT. So first thing is that we have the enucleation of an egg cell. What does that mean? Well, enucleation is basically the removal of the nucleus okay so wherever you see that phrase enucleation is the removal of the nucleus and in this case we're removing the nucleus from an egg cell then what we are going to do is we're going to take a somatic cell from the animal that we are going to clone and again we're going to remove the nucleus from that somatic cell what we then do we've got an empty egg cell and we've got a nucleus from our body cell, the somatic cell there. What we do is we fuse the nucleus from our donor cell with the enucleated egg. And the way that we achieve that is by applying this electric pulse or the process of electrofusion. So obviously electro referring to electricity and fusion joining there. Once we've actually got the nucleus fused with that enucleated egg, then basically what we've done is insert the nucleus into the egg cell. So we've created a new egg cell, but with that diploid nucleus in there. That egg is then going to start dividing to produce the small ball of cells as it would if it had been fertilized normally. And then we take the young embryo and we implant that into the uterus of our surrogate animal. Now that surrogate may be the same one that the actual original cell came from, could be a completely different one. Really doesn't matter, a surrogate is just the one that's basically providing the uterus for that little organism to develop in. So hopefully this little diagram just helps you to visualize the process a bit better. What we have then, this is our somatic body cell at the top. And what we're going to do is extract the nucleus first of all. At the same time, we've got our egg cell, we extract the nucleus, and that nucleus just discarded, we don't need it, it's irrelevant. And there we've got our enucleated egg cell, so an egg cell with no nucleus. The nucleus from our somatic body cell and our enucleated egg cell placed together, and then we fuse them in that electrofusion process, and then that's going to undergo normal cell division in order to produce our little clone in the future. That is then going to be inserted into the surrogate mother where it will fully develop. There is one point that we should bear in mind here, that even though we have obviously transferred the nucleus from our somatic body cell into the egg cell, that's the only thing we have transferred. We haven't swapped out all of the things like the mitochondria. And hopefully we do know that mitochondria actually contain their own DNA. So what we find is that it's not a complete clone of the donor because the entire genome is not identical. Yes, the DNA within the nucleus will be identical to the original body cell it came from, but the mitochondrial DNA will still be the same as the organism that the egg cell originated from. So just bear in mind that because we have DNA within the mitochondria, then that will not allow every bit of DNA to be genetically identical to the original somatic cell. We also 
have this process of non-reproductive cloning. So reproductive cloning, we're making organisms to obviously increase those numbers. Non-reproductive cloning is where basically we are cloning cells or tissues for something other than reproductive purposes. So the first one here is therapeutic cloning. This is where we're basically going to be producing some kind of a tissue or an organ to be a replacement for something that has been damaged. So think about people who've suffered very extensive burns and need a skin graft. We could potentially use our therapeutic cloning to grow the skin for that skin graft. Same ideas in terms of the repairing the insulin production in the pancreas for those people whose pancreas doesn't produce enough insulin. In theory, therapeutic cloning could restore that function. One point that we should bear in mind here is when we're looking at this therapeutic cloning technique, so trying to reverse some of these medical conditions, if you like, through using cloned cells, then if the tissues that we are growing came from the patient's own cells, then we won't have issues with rejection for the simple fact that those cells that we are creating will be genetically identical to the recipient. So that means the body will recognize them as self and therefore won't mount this immune response against them. Second idea is that we can create these tissues or organs that will allow us to then carry out further scientific studies. Now, this could be in terms of development of drugs. So when we're looking at testing drugs before they obviously go to market, etc., this is going to provide us with a supply of cells and tissues that will allow us to test those actual drugs for any dangerous side effects, for example. We can also have a look and see how genes are actually involved in different development and differentiation functions and maybe even looking into different chemicals that we can use in the whole techniques of gene switching so can we develop a particular treatment or drug that is going to allow us to basically switch off a particular gene if we can that could open up the realms of potential treatments for genetic conditions in the future so we can obviously generate lots of tissue and organ that can then be used in those scientific studies through this non-reproductive cloning. Last thing we need to do then in this video is consider the arguments for the artificial clones in animals and arguments against the artificial clones in animals. First of all, arguments for. If we're able to produce large numbers of genetically identical farm animals, they're all going to share those same desirable characteristics. So if you wanted a whole bunch of sheep that produce really woolly wool, then we could obviously produce them through artificial cloning. Every sheep within your flock will then have that same really woolly wool that then allows you to make maximum profit from them. Secondly, we don't need animals or humans in drug trials if we are using this non-reproductive cloning to produce, obviously, tissues and organs that we can test our drugs on. Thirdly, we can get genetically identical tissue, which then avoids the problems of rejection when we're looking at treating, obviously, different accidents or disease symptoms. We've got a method of doing that without the issues of rejection that we see with other donor material. And the last one, we already mentioned that reproductive cloning being used to increase population sizes of endangered species, hopefully preventing them from becoming extinct. The arguments against our artificial cloning in animals, well, same thing we saw with the plants. There's a lack of variation because they're all genetically identical to one another. Therefore, they're all susceptible to the same factors. One disease could wipe out a lot of them. That's not great. Secondly, the success rate of our adult cell cloning is actually pretty poor and the whole process, as you can imagine from looking at it, is expensive. As we found with Dolly the sheep and with other animals that we have cloned, then they may actually be less healthy than those produced through natural means and they've got shorter lifespans. So they develop a range of other conditions that were unexpected and they don't live as long. 
And finally, we've got the good old friend of ethical issues, because when we're talking about embryos, for example, when is it that we can get rid of it, so to speak, without creating a dilemma for some people? Now, obviously, this is going into the territory of religions, etc., and obviously belief systems, which is a very grey and murky area we're not going to delve into in A-level biology. But just be aware that there are ethical issues over the duration of the existence for embryos before we would deem it as a full life form. And that's something I'm not weighing into. You can make your own decisions on it there. As always, don't forget to subscribe so that you can see when I upload the next video. And of course, head on over to the website to get additional resources to help you out with your A-level biology studies.